thank you very much for your warm welcome. Uh, actually, could you turn my microphone down a little? Thank you. Um, I want to look at your future. My theme is this, either we take hold of our future or the future takes hold of us. And that's what today is about. It's about decisions. It's about things that you can do tomorrow morning or maybe Monday morning uh, to make a huge difference in the world in which you operate. I spend much of my time looking at wildcard trends. These are low probability but high impact risks, all kinds of society changes, things which can affect uh, you, whether you're running a health authority or a police department, uh, whether you are uh, in charge of social services or the collection of waste. Whatever it is, uh, we are affected by changes inside our organizations and outside. Often for you, they are politically driven changes, uh, but they may be also from society. But what I want to talk about is this. How do you make things happen? How do you change your organization? How do you make sure that the whole team are running with you? How do you engage the people you work with so that they feel like getting out of bed in the morning and really making a difference? And uh, I've, I've been on a personal journey and I just want to explain a little bit of it to you. You see, I started off not talking to corporations about global trends. I started off as a physician. In fact, as a terminal care hospice physician in London, looking after men and women who are dying at home and their families. And that was my job. And uh, I did that for a number of years. Um, and in fact, through that, um, I landed up getting involved with HIV and AIDS. Um, and uh, so I've, I've worked in the National Health Service. I've worked in the hospice movement, which is selling services to the National Health Service. I have uh, looked to clone the lessons that we learned from the hospice movement and bring them into the National Health Service. So the team I worked with at UCH was modeled on a hospice. Um, and also then found that there were defective things within the NHS and having to start an AIDS NGO. And the reason I did was because I found that people who were dying of AIDS were dying terribly in London in teaching hospitals and uh, even my own cancer team would not get involved. That was a failure of my own leadership, by the way. I came, I went on to an AIDS ward. I saw young men suffocating to death in a side room. Uh, one young man in particular, he had tubes out of every orifice. He was <laughs> His knuckles were white with fear. He was within hours of death. And there was no, uh, no nurse with him, no social worker. His family were not there. I said, where is his family? They said, you can't call them because they don't know he has this problem and he doesn't want them to know. I said, so you're going to call them at three o'clock in the morning and tell them to collect their son in a body bag. And he was getting all the wrong medicine. It was like 35 years of hospice medicine had stood still. And I came up, I, I don't like confrontation. I had a, a big barnstorm on the ward about what was happening. I came off the ward shaking. I was a relatively junior doctor. On my first visit to an AIDS ward, and having to fundamentally challenge what was going on. But you know what even more shook me was when I went back to my own colleagues and they said, ha, you're on your own, mate. I hope you haven't got any new referrals. I said, I'm sorry? Well, we're a cancer team. We're not going to be involved with these. And then I found that the Meals and Wheels service would not go in, or if they did, they rang the doorbell and then they ran away because they were afraid that HIV would hop through the air and they would get infected and so on. And that's how AIDS Asset started, an AIDS organization which uh, my wife and I have been involved in now since 1987 and is now active in many, many, many countries um, in places like Uganda, Russia, Thailand, uh, Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and the rest. So that's part of my story. It was a failure of my own leadership. We had to clone an AIDS team within the National Health Service. It took 10 years to mold these two teams together. Why? Because the cancer team couldn't see it was part of their mission at all. Um, it was a failure of my leadership. I failed to engage my own team in a process of change. So we had to go around them and invent something new. And then we had to invent an NGO totally outside of the National Health Service. 
um, and, uh, and, 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 and the rest is history because it became a new movement. So that's been part of my, my journey. And yet, um, uh, and, and it was through writing books about AIDS and seeing things happen and writing other things that companies started to ask me uh, to comment, not uh, having had the experience of running an NGO, commenting on a very wide range of issues and trends, started to ask me to give advice on how they should run their businesses. And I began to learn something, which is that you can stay in an organization like the National Health Service, or you can decide to manage a team and create a movement. Um, and uh, sometimes you can be more effective. I know for many of you this is a dilemma, to stay closer to clients or to manage. But often you can have greater impact by managing through your leadership you can raise up a whole generation of others that will go on and do what you have been doing in the past, inspiring them with the same vision and passion to make a difference than if you stayed where you were. And in fact, through, people say, well, why did you come out of looking after people who are dying? I said, well, I've created, there have been whole generations of people who've gone into hospice work, into social work, into nursing, into medicine, into just care services within the social services, as social workers, because of the work of asset. And then they said, well, why are you not doing asset full time now? And I said, well, because I've had opportunities to influence companies. And I've learned that actually you can touch one company, one big company, like Barclays Bank in South Africa. And suddenly, you find 25,000 worlds change. And I'm still involved with the, asset, the AIDS charity about 30, 35% of my time. So that's a personal journey. And the reason why I say that is because it affects what I want to say to you now about making a difference. But before I do, I just want to give you one, one thought, one trend. Your entire future will be dependent on one word. Only one word will drive the biggest changes in Wales, and that is, of course, you know what I'm going to say, don't you? Demographics. And why do I say that? Well, because it doesn't matter who you are. You might be in charge of maternity services or services for the elderly. You might be in charge of the regeneration projects for um, disadvantaged areas of Cardiff. Uh, you might be in charge of rural services for people who are living alone and are vulnerable, whatever it is. Demographics drives absolutely everything that you will be doing. So I just want to have a quick look at it, and then we'll go on to the issues of how to make a difference. And the first thing is, and you know this, that Europe as a whole is dying. In fact, uh, if it wasn't for immigration, the UK as a whole would become extinct. In case you don't believe me, the number of children being born in many towns and cities across the UK is such that their populations would halve in every generation, and this applies to Wales as well. Um, in Germany, the population is 80 million today, but will drop to 40 million in a single generation. In the following generation, it will probably drop to 20, because you either make babies or you have to import them. And the average couple, my friends, in Wales is only having a well, about 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, 1 1.5 children. Well, you need to produce 2.3, 2.4 children per couple just to keep your population the same. And you're going to say to me, no, Patrick, you know nothing about Wales. Our population is growing. Yes, of course it is. And why? Because of immigration. You say, well, it's immigration from across the border. That's true. It's immigration, and it's happening very fast. And you're going to see a lot more of it. You're going to see immigration on a big scale from Eastern Europe, if you haven't already, in your, in your own part of Wales. I'll tell you why. In the last two years, over 650 to 700,000 people have come from Poland, Slovenia, Slovakia, and Croatia, places like that, into the UK. 600,000. The government officially planned, on your estimates, for 9,000, of which about 2,000 would come to Wales. So, in fact, there are 200,000 Poles now working in the UK. By the way, that figure I just gave you was officially registered. I'm not talking about people who haven't officially registered for work. I'm talking about, I'm just talking about the people who've officially registered. So we're talking about probably about a million new citizens just from the new European countries coming into the UK just in the last three, in the last two years and the next 12 months. So I hope you're ready for that. That's why I'm saying the future is about demographics. We have to understand it. Um, and because, because we have this famine of babies, you see, the reason why we have an aging population in, in Wales is because uh, people have stopped making babies. If people had carried on making babies, we wouldn't have an aging population. If people were having four babies per family, there wouldn't be no aging challenge in Wales anywhere. Now, that's why you're going to see a lot of debate in Wales about encouraging people to have children over the next 10 years. Now, this graph is really interesting. 
Uh, on this line here is the UK average, and here is Wales as a whole, okay? Not so many differences. Yes, you're a bit older than the average, okay? A bit of a famine when it comes to younger people. I'll come on to that. But look at this. This is interesting. This is Vale of Glamorgan. Oh, my. What a difference. What happened? Well, you're actually gaining people here, older people, 54 plus. Yes, you've got more of them than you'd expect. But where are all these young people? Where have they gone? You're slightly down on them anyway compared to the UK as a whole. But if you look at the Vale of Glamorden, there's a famine. A famine of 20 to 29-year-olds. They're just missing. They're not there. In fact, if you look at Newport, they're gone. They're not in Newport. The clubs, the pubs, the, the wine bars, they're empty. Why? Because there aren't any. I'm exaggerating. But there aren't any uh, uh, 20 to 29-year-olds. And what that means, of course, is that you're shortly going to have a famine of 0 to 4-year-olds. So demographics is incredibly important, even within Wales, where people go. So where do they go? Newport. Well, they go to Cardiff. And uh, you can see uh, they're all turning up in Cardiff. From 15 years on, uh, Cardiff is the place. It's the coolest, hippiest, um, most exciting place in the whole of Wales for anyone who's under the age of 30. Let's face it, that's where people want to go. That's what this shows. And as they come, they bring with them all kinds of challenges for you, in terms of unemployment, social changes, policing, infrastructure, housing, um, uh, very young mothers, with uh, unmarried mums with babies, and all kinds of things are happening in Cardiff right now as a direct result of this thing. So Newport, Cardiff, we better get it right. Demographics is everything. It shapes every single decision that you will make over the next 35 years regarding the future of Wales. Okay, uh, London, well, that's where they all actually end up. A little bit later, See, they, they, they move off. They were in Cardiff. <laughs> they stayed there for five years. Then they went on to London. And uh, 25 to 35-year-old, 40-year-olds, massively populating London. Now, uh, that's a simplistic view, but I'm just saying demographics is important. Now, four insights on business. The first is the speed of change. I'm trying to cope with some of these challenges. Just immigration changes, for example. And the lesson of history is that many things are changing faster than you can even plan a service. It takes time to build a hospital. It takes a long time to build a new school. Um, and then here's another issue uh, which I've been learning. The future is not about technology. It's not about social services. And in a way, it's not even about demographics. It's about emotion. And that's why we don't believe market research. Market research for your clients can't tell you the future because they keep changing their minds. They say they're, in, they're never going to move to Cardiff. The following day, they've gone. <laughs> so your client group disappeared. You say, how could they do that to me? Well, so listen to your clients, but don't believe what they say. Please. Because they change their minds faster than you can plan a service. What we have to look is the wider demographic trends. We have to try to anticipate how they might change their behavior in the future. Um, I'm going to show you a video that was banned in, in the whole of the UK on TV. I thought you'd like to see it. It passed the market research test, and the big question is, why was it banned? message all week, but <laughs> I'll tell you this, why was the video banned? I mean, I show it to every country in the world, they all roll over laughter, they bang their heads on the table, they wet themselves, they're, so, they're laughing so hard, but what I want to know is, then they pop up and they say, what is wrong with the UK? Tell me, what is wrong with the UK? Why is it that in Wales I will be put in prison if I try and show that on TV? <laughs> what happened? You found it funny. So why was there such a big reaction? Remember, market research told us the truth, which is that everybody thought it was wonderful. You show it on TV, 
Everybody thought it was awful, and it was taken off. Any ideas why? I don't know why. Any guesses? Reaction? Yeah, there was a big reaction. Any ideas why? Yes. People don't like being reminded of death. Yes, that means quite a lot to me as someone who's worked in the hospice movement a lot and with people dying of AIDS. That's true. Any other thoughts? I think that's really true. Someone has just lost someone. Yes, that's right. As every social worker would say, that would not pass my social work test for entertainment on a Sunday morning for nine-year-old children on their own just after burying their grandfather the previous day. Uh, what happened to grief counselling? Um, that's true. Um, and there's something else here about life speeding up, isn't there? Put your hands up if you noticed that Christmas Day came around a whole week earlier last year than the week before. <laughs> you know, it's a strange thing, isn't there? There's a truism, if you like. But behind that is something else. And you know what? When I show this to corporate audiences, I get a different reaction. Most of them put their hands up and they say, that's me, that's me. And it's very disturbing. Very funny, but actually quite traumatic. That is me, hurtling, 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 so fast, driven by market forces, the next quarter's figures, and everything else as well. And suddenly, bang, it's over. And uh, you know what? This is the UK survey, and it's a sur survey of people in business as a whole, uh, but I believe that it has relevance to you. It shows that 90% of 30 to 40-year-olds want to get out of any kind of commercial job because they can't stand it anymore. This should be good news for you. If you're interested in war for talent, I'll tell you this. Who here has worked in a business environment in the past before you got into public services? Put your hands up and wave them around. Have a look around. You are harvesting a challenge in business. Business is lying awake at night worrying about this. You should be celebrating it. Now, why are people drifting? I'll tell you why they're drifting out of business. Because they can't see the point. Put your hands up if that's the reason why you got out of business and got into public services. Put your hands up. It was become something to do with purpose and making a difference. Put your hands up now. It certainly wasn't for the pay, was it? Okay. Now, 60% of 25 to 35-year-olds feel unfulfilled. 80% are having a quarter-life crisis. And 60% say they see no meaningful purpose to get out of bed in the morning. And what I want to talk about in terms of leadership is passion. Connecting with passion. Because it really, really matters. And the problem is this. I'm seeing it even in public services, and that's a pity. You see, in public services, it's so obvious. If you're in a company, okay, what do you do? Well, you just make orange juice, big deal. You know, one orange juice bottle looks a bit like another. But if you are in social services, and you are protecting children, and trying to make big decisions about whether a child should stay with their natural mum and dad, or whether they should be taken into foster care, and you're really concerned about the future of that child, and you've got a case history. You've got adults that still send you Christmas cards and birthday cards and things because they were your, in your care. And you saw them through. And they say, thank God you rescued me when you did and thank God you then got me back with my mum. So I was only out for six months, but then you put us back together again. And that horrible judge, you told him to go and kick himself. And you put me back. And you saved me. And you made me what I am. And you believed in me, and you actually believed my mum could do it. And you gave her the help, and she did it. I'll tell you what, this is really important. And what I find sad is that morale can be very low in public services, and those especially who are ministering and organising can get so detached from the real passion of the work. And then we find morale is low, sickness goes up, turnover, uh, and everything starts to fall to bits. But you are the most incredible people, the things that you do to make a difference. And it should be so easy to get passion, and yet in practice, it's quite difficult. See, the issue is this. It's passion at work, and trying to connect it with the passions we have for life outside of work. Let me explain. You see, passion can never come from pressure. You can, you can set an agenda, a targets, measurements, and all the other things, some of which you've heard about this week, which are wonderful things, but they cannot generate passion. Passion comes from purpose. The sort of things that you were hearing about from my good uh, friend um, uh, with, the, with the hair like Einstein, who came to talk to you at the age of 80 years old, and I think you found him very moving, I guess. 
because he talks about what it is to be loved, uh, to care. He touched passion. Um, and passions drive people. So I want to dig a little bit more into this as I try to gather together some of the themes of the week. We've talked a little bit about caring for yourself, mind, body, spirit, however you define it. Uh, yes, that's fine. But you know, passions are more than that. In fact, you will never generate passion by caring for an individual self. You say, how so? Let me say again, you will never generate passion by caring for an individual self. You can offer someone a pay rise, you won't create passion. You can offer them a stimulating job. Yes, you'll get an intellectual fascination. You may even get a commitment, but you won't get passion. True passion comes from something else, usually. I'm exaggerating a little bit to provoke us. But just hang in there. You see, if you look at happiness, and I know you've looked a little bit at some of this this week, what is the secret of finding happiness? Well, we can list all these things off, you know, um, to be in the middle range of income, not too much, not too little. It's true, if you're in either extreme, it's correlated with depression. Uh, to have good friends, a stable marriage is correlated with, with, uh, with happiness, uh, to have a, spiritual faith, uh, a spirituality, a strong faith, to be reasonably outgoing and uh, someone who tends to be slightly sunny by nature, um, people who like their jobs, they live in a stable democracy, that's true, all of those things. But, you know what? As every GP will tell you, as every family doctor will tell you, one of the most effective ways um, for someone to find happiness is to feel that they found a cause. Um, you know what? An old woman or man who's 78 years old, 88 years old, if they have a cat or a dog, do you know what? They live longer. Why do they live longer? Because there's someone else to live for. Uh, if they have lived with a husband or a wife or a partner for 50 years and the partner dies, you know what happens? The life expectancy rate of the other person falls dramatically. They die of, well, not just a broken heart, but a broken purpose. And then they'll say things like, well, I'm living for the grandchildren. Or, Sophie, my cat, needs me. And they'll stagger on to the age of 129, still looking after Sophie the cat. When Sophie the cat is gone, the passion to live can change. So we begin to understand something. You know what? Uh, if one, of the, one of the things that can cause death of spirit is when someone says, I don't think I make any difference to anyone else's life in any way whatsoever. You know that? Um, who here knows someone who's been de profoundly depressed? Perhaps you've even wrestled with it yourself. And you know, one of the most difficult things, you know, the GP or whoever it is that's trying to help them, you might be. So you've got so many things to live from. And then they say, Chris, there's not a single person whose life is different because I'm still around. I think even their lives would be better off if I was dead. Wow. And this is death of the spirit, isn't it? And because a person becomes convinced they can't make a difference. Um, and what we begin to understand is that a key, a very powerful key to passion, is helping someone to understand how they really do make a difference. And you know what? It's not enough to be loved. Chris could say, listen, I really love you. I will miss you every day. Do you know what? I will weep every day for years if you do, if you do something awful to yourself. And still they'll say, yes, but I don't really contribute anything to your life. I'm just a nuisance. I'm just in the way. So it's not enough to be loved. You have to know that you're needed. And this desire to be needed is fundamental to engaging with passion. And I want to ask you a question. You know, for Gary or for, or for, or for Sue or for whoever you are, do the people in your teams really know that they're needed? Do they know that they really make a difference? And could they explain to their children or their friends exactly why it's so important that they do turn up tomorrow morning at nine? Whose world will really fall to bits if they don't get that report in? Why it really matters that this team actually delivers in the next three months? Do they really know? And you know, often I find that the people at the coalface do. 
the individual nurse who's struggling on a night shift with severe shortages of staff, who's had two people fall out of bed in the last six hours simply because she didn't have enough staff to run around the ward. And there was various locum staff who didn't seem to understand what they were doing. Yes, she knows. But I often wonder whether the accountant in the hospital knows, or whether the cleaner really knows, or whether the, the person who's doing the transport really knows. I'll give you an example. I've got a 101-year-old relative. And let me tell can I just tell you something in confidence? Will that be okay? I can't imagine this will get back to her. Uh, but when you are 101 and you're a woman and, uh, and, and, or a man, uh, blood can be a challenge. And you know what? Uh, the, uh, the, sometimes the ambulance will come at 7 in the morning or 9.30 in the morning to take her to the clinic. And it's a long roundabout journey. And she needs to know when the ambulance is coming so that she can sort herself out. Because there's no time to go to the toilet when the ambulance arrives. And you know what? She has often found herself severely embarrassed and has actually wet herself in the ambulance because of the whole process of being so long. Does the ambulance driver know that it really matters to her if he's late? Does he really know the distress, the shame to this highly sophisticated and intelligent and self-respecting woman to be incontinent in front of all these people when she comes out of the ambulance and wet through everything. Does he know? Probably not. Perhaps he does, but does the administrator know who put him on that particular round in that particular direction? And they say, oh, by the way, you've got three more to pick up tomorrow morning in the other direction. It's going to take 45 minutes longer. Does he know? That's what I'm saying about engaging with passion. Um, and that, you know, we can uh, just talk about self, yes, but life is more than that. Um, for most people, there are bigger passions than self, much bigger. Um, can I ask... Who here has had a discussion about getting a better balance between different parts of your life, and you know, work and other bits? And the, okay, all of you have. Why? Because, of course, there's more to your life than life. Uh, it's about relationships and family. And work-life balance is now number one or number two career priority. Let me ask another question. Who here in your job advertising says, come to Vale of Glamorgan Social Services for a better work-life balance? This is number one or number two career priority. It's one of the commonest reasons why people want out of business. They want to come to people who understand they're real people, whole people, that there is a family. They want to work for bosses who understand that if you've got one child at home with chicken pox and then the other goes down, uh, your childcare has fallen to bits at that point and actually you're going to need to stay home. Uh, and when you have a boss that understands that, your commitment goes up. Why? Because there's a passion to family. Um, Here's another example, well, an example of this is, you know, here's the survey. Virtually all women at work say they're worn out with the demands of work at home, which they believe is damaging their health. The majority believe that work is aging them, and they feel stressed most of the time. This was a European survey. I'm sure it doesn't apply to you. Any of you. <laughs> but the fact is, this is an important issue. So there's a passion about family. So we add another layer. We understand that family, I mean... Whatever your family group is, your friendships, uh, your so special people, whoever they are, I'm dividing family broadly. But we discover there's a second circle of the human heart, the family, relationships, incredibly important. And if we want to provoke people to connect with the passions people have at work, then we need to understand them as whole people and take them with us in this very, very important area. And then we're going to look at the lessons from volunteering. I'm interested in this because of the work with Asset, and I've been so inspired over the years by what people have done. Um, and it doesn't matter what country you are, um, the majority of people in every audience I've ever spoken to give time to things they really believe in, not because they're paid by social services, but just because they want to. And it's outside of work. Let me ask you. I'd like you, in a moment, to put your hands in the air if in the last two or three years you've given time to things for nothing, not because it was in your job, nothing to do with the job, actually, but you just knew you wanted to. Um, you might have taken a tin for the tsunami disaster. You could have uh, helped out at your local school on the Parent Teachers Association. Maybe uh, you do the accounts of a small charitable trust, and maybe you help teach some children to read. Uh, maybe you visit um, an old lady next door who cannot do her own shopping, and she cannot clear the snow in the winter. 
Uh, maybe whatever it is, but if you've done things for nothing, maybe you're part of a church as I am, or a synagogue or a mosque, whatever it is, but if you've done things for nothing in the last two to three years, put your hands up now. And here we see passion. And you know what? You will learn more about each other on your tables in three minutes, sharing why the hands went up or why they didn't. Because it may be that you're saying, well, right now I have outsourced it. I pay other people to give their time. But right now I'm too busy because I've got three children at home. I'm doing a double career. My husband's got a busy career. Whatever it is, but I'll do it in the future. Or I had a gap year when I was a student. I believe in it, but I can't do it now. But you saw the hands go up, and you will learn more in three minutes about each other from why the hands went up and from the story. You know, why is it that particular organization? Why is it breast cancer charity and you're a man? And you know what? Behind every hand there is a personal story and each of those stories is something that you will learn in three minutes and you will learn more about Alex in that time than in three years working on the same team because that's where the passion is you're going to find out something about Alex that he'll do when he retires maybe even where he'll leave a massive legacy after he's died uh, you'll find something about Alex that probably his kids are involved in um, something about Alex that, um, that has got a deep root somewhere. It will be a personal story somewhere along the line about something that Alex is doing. And we learn about from volunteering that there's another third layer of the human heart, the third circle, which is community, because this is all about community, these passions. And the wonderful thing is that everybody in Wales feels these things just about. Yes, we may express them in different ways and to different degrees, but community passion is really, really important. And you'll find it in every shareholder of every publicly listed company anywhere in the world. You'll find it in the majority of people in every business, uh, in every society, at every age. And you say, no, that's not true, Patrick. That is absolute rubbish. Most people, in my experience, are totally selfish. <laughs> really? You know what? Uh, and <laughs> it isn't most people's experience. Most people say that most people they work with are fairly decent, ordinary, honest people. And then there's another circle of the human heart which is really really important if we're to engage with passion and that is the wider world that might be the issue of sustainability or global warming but it could be something as simple as Iraq or as complicated put your hands in the air if you've had a passionate conversation about what should be done about the war in Iraq in the last two years oh now um, can I just ask uh, do you know anyone who lives in Iraq uh, do you know anyone who lives anywhere near anybody else who lives in Iraq. I mean, it's nothing to do with us, is it? Why is it that we in this room are so stirred up about what happens in a faraway country to people we've never met and never will? It's irrational in a way. Mm? Oh, you've got family members over there. Okay, you have had. Well, you're unusual because most of the people here have no business to feel so passionate about it compared to you. And yet we do feel engaged. And that engagement is what I want to talk about. Because you might think that the people in your workplace, they're only really interested in themselves. They, it's difficult to get them to do anything more. And that, yeah, they're interested in their families, but that's about it. But actually, you find these other passions. And they're very strong. So we're beginning to understand that there are four corners of the human heart, four circles of the human heart. That there are people who have self-interests. Yes, they're very, very powerful. And we're right to focus on them and to make people feel that they're satisf uh, satisfied in what they do, that they're challenged, that they're honored, appreciated, and respected. Uh, but we need to go beyond that and understand that actually people have huge passions for outside of life, outside of your life, outside of your strategic targets and your operational goals. Uh, they are passionate about their families, their relationships, their communities. They're passionate about Iraq, global warming, save the whale, whatever it is. And you know what? If you can start to touch these different areas of passion and bring them into the organization, you'll find yourself in a very different place as regards some leadership. So, individuals talk about their needs, family, community, wider world. And making a difference, of course, is our fundamental slogan. And it really, really matters in public services and also in contractors who are providing services. Let me give you an example. Service master is one of the largest cleaning contractors to hospitals and schools in America. And it does the worst job of all. It trains people to clean toilets. Big time. 
I mean, they have, you know, 500,000 people who clean toilets or whatever it is around the world. And it's a big job. And it's a job that most hospitals find very difficult to recruit for. You know how they've done it? What they do is they get a new employer, employee, and they sit them down, and they say, listen, Jerry, I want you to know, firstly, we're going to give you a great uniform, um, and we're going to give you great training. We want you to know that you are in the healthcare business, uh, that actually uh, what you're doing is the, you are one of the most important people in the hospital, uh, that you save lives every day. Every single day you save lives, and you do it by preventing cross-infection, preventing people from getting diarrhea, preventing them from getting multiple resistant staphylococcus, uh, you prevent them from getting uh, in complications in operations. More than that, you are a morale booster and you're a team builder. Because you know what? When people are ultimately stressed, they want to go and have a break, what do they do? They go, and have, they go to the toilet. And when they go on there, they just take one sniff and think, oh my word, and they get out as fast as their legs can carry them. But when you've done it, they walk in there and think, hey, oh, oh this is nice. And, they, and you know what? Before, the, before very long, you've got a team meeting going on in there. Because there's other people coming in and they chat and they talk. And when people come in and they see a place that's so clean they could eat scrambled egg off the floor, it raises their spirits and they think, that's great. I'll tell you, you are the, also the biggest welcomer in the hospital because the first thing that happens when an overstressed relative has had a very long journey and before they even go to the lift, the very first thing they do, the first point of contact, physical contact in the entire hospital is with the, <laughs> it's with the toilet seat which someone has left up or whatever it is. It's with your territory. It's your room. It's the biggest welcome reception in the whole hospital. And it's the place where, and, and people judge our entire institution by the state of this toilet. So you're in the healthcare business, you're in the morale building business, you're in the team building business, and what's more, I want you to know we really believe in you. We believe there's more to you than cleaning toilets. In fact, we're going to train you, we're going to put you through night school, we're going to give you leadership development, and our aim is to get you up or out. So we either get you into management training teams in the future, or we'll move you into another job with another organization, because that's what we're about, because we believe in you. And you can imagine that they have very low turnover. In fact, their turnover is about half, because they go in with a sense of self-esteem. They do the, the most disgusting jobs on their hands and knees that no one else wants to do when they unplug block toilets and, and they take the chewing gum out, but they do it with a spring in their step because they know that they are one of the most important healthcare workers in the entire hospital. And in fact, if this is disgusting, people will literally die. And that helps them a lot. And so I'm saying that helping to connect with these wider passions is really, really important. Um, and it helps us to win the war for talent. Um, and, uh, you know, life's too short, my friends, to spend on projects that can't deliver because they're badly run. Um, people who just won't change and projects without purpose. In fact, I'd say this. If you don't believe in the job that you're doing, if you don't think you can deliver on your targets because the place is crap, I'd say get out. Get out. Believe in yourself enough to say, hey, I'm walking. I'm out of here. Because I believe in myself enough to know I'm going to go and make a difference somewhere else. If I can't make a difference here, I'm going. And it's when you do that with a spring in a step and an act of self-confidence and a little bit of cheeky defiance, actually those are the very people you want in an organization. And you know, time after time after time, I found it's actually been the willingness that someone has had to walk that actually has forced the change to happen. Because someone has had the guts and the integrity to say, this is it. This is the ground on which I stand. I walked. I said, either we get involved with AIDS or I'm out. Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, employer passion and engagement is really important. This is an incredibly important Gallup survey. Uh, this is a meta survey of 10 million people. It includes people in, in, in public health and, uh, and social services and things like that. So forgive that word businesses, okay? It's organizations. If people score on a 12-point score, go to Gallup and get this stuff. It's fantastic. It's 12 simple questions you ask people. As a result of 12 questions, you can score their engagement with your mission. And by the way, disengagement is easy to spot. Disengagement says, I don't know why I still work for this organization. I should have left years ago. That's disengagement. Engagement is when someone's actually actively promoting the mission and the purpose and is passionate and enthusiastic about working for you. And those who are in the top half of engagement score 
compared to the others, are 86% more likely to, to serve uh, their clients better. 70% more likely to have low staff turnover, 70% more likely to be highly productive, 44% more likely to actually meet their cost targets. Um, and uh, if you can do only small things, small things can raise your engagement score. You've only got to increase it by two or three percentage terms and you have a dramatic effect on the team. And you know, one of the things which is strongly linked to engagement, strangely enough, is the answer to a single question, which is this. Do you have a close friend in the same team? If you don't, it's almost impossible for the person to experience engagement. That's what the survey shows. If you have a strong friend in the same team, the chances are much higher that the person will be engaged. Why is that? Well, it's because it's within the human being to do it together. DIY, do it yourself, that doesn't produce passion. But we are social creatures. We go for things together. We make things happen. So Mark and I say, we are going to go for this, and we're going to take Sarah and Judy with us, and let's try and get them together, and hopefully we can move the whole team. And together we're going to make this difference. And because I like Mark, take him out for a drink. He's my mate. Uh, he's been with me through good times and bad teams. I can trust him with my life. You know what? What we've done is we've created not a team now, we've created a people movement. And that's really exciting. People movements, what are they? You see, a team, well, the team's all very well. What it means is, sorry, what's your name? Caroline, is it? Paula. Paula can lead this team. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's great, but she won't change the world. Why not? Because a team is a team. And all of Paula's leadership is then just locked up to whether she can motivate you. But a people movement is something different. A people movement is where through Paul's, Paula's friendship and her moral authority, her influence, her bubbly personality, her infectious values, she is actually changing the way that you're working. You're not even in the same hierarchical tree, but you know her. And, uh, and things are happening. It might be something as simple as Paula says, I can't stand gossip. I have a rule. No gossip. Nobody talks behind my back. Nobody, no, I talk behind no one else's back unless I'm going to bring it with them in the next 24 hours. That is my rule. It's the rule as a team. You know what happens? A whole layer of conversation stops. As soon as Paula even walks, oh, mm -mm, conversation changes. And before you know where you are, it spreads around. Why? Because it's such a moral issue. It's just a straightforward question. So uh, we suddenly find that actually they've been napping about it. And, and Chris said one day in her team, you know what? I'm sorry, friends. I don't like gossip. <laughs> what was that about? Well, I don't know, someone talked over coffee and Chris thought, well, that's right, I've thought that for years. It's about time someone said it, I'm going to say it. And so these values spread. Um, and people movements, this can, uh, and this, here's one with asset. Here's Thomas, he just grabbed a vision of how he could train volunteers in the Czech Republic and make a difference. And he's seen 640,000 people using a team of 30 volunteers in schools with a life-saving message. He's fr he sent a friend, Marek, into Russia. Russia uh, is, a, is a huge challenge for AIDS. Marek has trained 260 educators. Many of those have started to go into other countries themselves carrying a message. Led by Thomas? No. People movement. Tribal leadership. Because when you engage with passion, whole networks get motiv motivated to change without you necessarily even having to have a change management program. Because you capture passion, something happens. It's extraordinary. Um, and uh, here's another team in Ukraine. They got it from Marek. Marek got it from Thomas. Thomas got it from somewhere else, and he got it from me some years ago. You know, these things uh, crank on. Pret and leadership, well, what's the answer? Well, yes, you've heard about trust. Hard to win, easy to lose. Yes, that's true, but, and you can say trust. Well, how do you build it? You'd be truthful, reliable, upright, sincere, tough. All of those things, yes, builds trust, but trust is not enough. Why? I can trust you, I just don't like where you're going. Sorry. You say, well, that's, that's your calling in life, but it's not mine. So I'm going to go this way. So trust doesn't, doesn't produce leadership on, 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 as of, of itself. I have to be convinced that where you're going is where I want to be. And when I'm convinced that's the right way to go, then I'll follow. So I can trust you totally as a person, but I have to be convinced that you're ahead, I have to be convinced that you know the route, and I have to be convinced that I want to get there too. Um, and uh, you know, anyone can lead. Uh, a woman uh, in a cinema 
uh, who shouts there's a huge fire, suddenly she's exercising leadership. You could have managing directors of the largest companies in the world and they will follow her at that moment. You do not need a change management program when the answer is clear, the direction is obvious. Change management programs are a waste of space unless people are convinced that it's for a better world. And when they are convinced it's a better world for them, for their families or the people they care for, and that can be a family team for us, our club, our tribe. When we're convinced it's best for the community, for our patients, for those we're trying to look after, for, those, for the older people in Vale of Morgan. When we're convinced it's been done in the right way, and on balance, when you look at all the pain and all the cost and all the benefit, it's the morally right thing to do. You know what? You don't need a change management program. You don't need extensive change management consultants. People will change. Martin could lead this whole team here. Martin could be intellectually unconvinced about this change of government policy. In fact, he's stonewalling. He's backpedaling. He's refusing to even put it on the agenda. But you know what? If all of you are so excited about it, you just think it's the most exciting reform that's come in. It's so obvious. It's a no-brainer. In fact, you've started doing it already. And even though it hasn't been agreed by Martin, hasn't even been discussed as a team, do you know Martin can't even stop the change from happening? Why? I'll tell you why. Because there's more to leadership than hierarchy. And what's happening, there's a people movement. There's a vision that's flowing around the organization, and you've got it. And Martin, he decided to work somewhere else. And that's fine. So we, we're learning something very important here. So the better way to change an organization is to persuade people that the end result will be worth the effort. When you actually do that, then change happens. Connect with passion. By the way, how to increase productivity by more than 50% and then I'll finish. Would you like to know that? Who would like to increase your productivity for no additional cost for, by 50%? Well, I'm, uh, who's heard of the 80-20 rule? Okay, well, some of you have, and I, must, uh, I, I need to be out of here in about 20 seconds. Right. The 80-20 rule is the most important rule for effective leadership. When you've got the passion, you're leading with integrity about things that you really feel passionately about, respecting those you work with, listening to them, encouraging them, affirming them, uh, and all of these things. And then there's the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule says this, and it's a rule of business, but it's a rule of total life, that 80% of the, of the impact comes from 20% of all of your effort. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, in, in, in actually 10 minutes, you've probably got to 80% of the problems that need to be sorted out with this particular patient. The rest is over time, if you've got it. Um, in 10 minutes on the phone, with a mum who's distraught about how we're going to manage the problem child at home, in 10 minutes on that phone, you may have helped to manage that problem and nurse it over for the next, uh, for the next day or two, rather than having to bomb around and do a you know, journey there one hour, journey back one hour, two hours in the home. At, at the 80-20 rule tells you that 80% of the work is done by 20% of your team. When it comes to a new initiative, uh, the 80-20 rule tells you that 80% of the, your leadership impact comes from a fifth of what you do. See, well, how can that be? I tell you what, I mean, any of you, within five to 10 minutes, I could, bet I could identify some 80-20s. So it might be for Margaret, says, well, what's your 80-20? Margaret says, well, I guess I've got two or three people I really, really depend on a lot, but they're not quite up to speed and I'm not able to give them real departmental responsibilities yet. So you know what your 80-20 is? which is probably the most effective hour of every week, is the one hour you spend on a one-to-one -one basis with each of them. It's two hours a week. Mentoring, coaching, encouraging, equipping, supervising, delegating, and checking. And with clear accountability, oversight, and with one or two phone calls and a couple of emails, they're actually doing fine. And suddenly you've doubled your productivity, right? Because you've now got two full-time people working for you who are working flat out and doing really, really well the most effective two hours you could possibly spend every week of your entire life. Uh, a friend of mine writes little notes of encouragement. How long does it take to write a note? 30 seconds. How long do you keep a note? Who here has got a note on your mantelpiece or on your desk and you've kept it for more than a month? A note of encouragement. How long does it take to write one? Two minutes. If you go to his office, what's the first thing you pick up when he's gone to get a cup of coffee? You read his notes, right? And you put them straight back so that he doesn't see you've read them, okay? She said, I'm just getting a cup of coffee. Thank God for that. You read them all, put them back. 
And as you read them all, you're encouraged. Why are you encouraged? This is crazy. Um, Richard spent 20 seconds writing a little note saying, thank you, for, you really helped, and that mentoring session was fantastic, etc., etc. And you're encouraged. Why? Because little things make a lot of difference. That's the 80-20 rule. Find your 80-20 and do more of it. Is there something you could do in 4% of your time to generate up to 64% of your impact? Yes, there is. Probably. 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 So stop and think about what you're doing. Be ruthless about time stealers there in the 20% impact for 80% of the time. Be realistic about your goals. Cut out things which really don't matter. Reduce and shorten your meetings. Delegate in power like crazy. Use the dead time. Make sure you're online when you travel or whatever it is. Keep things moving on and appreciate each day and enjoy the moment. And when you can add passion, purpose, and a sense of fun to the focus which comes through 80-20, then you really start to make things happen. So let your passion show. Be the person that you were made to be. Have the courage of your own convictions. Be known as someone who stands for principle in your own leadership. Um, uh, focus on what's important to you. Decide to make the difference. And live as you want others to live. You know, example is the most important form of leadership that you can have. So we make, every, make sure that every target, it matters to you. If it doesn't matter to you, scrap it. If it's someone else's target, forget it. It's got to matter to you if you're going to lead people, isn't it? It's no good inheriting someone else's target. If it doesn't matter to you, you need to go back and challenge the target. Go all the way back up to the top and say, this target is crap. I can't implement it. That's what leadership is about. It's leading up. It's mentoring up. It's helping the administrators above you to get real with what's actually going on and the realities of the ground. And that's one of the problems in public services that often that doesn't happen. Um, so it matters to you, it inspires others, it's clear, realistic, it's agreed, it's reviewed, and it's rewarded. So your leadership example can last a very long time. It lasts many generations, in fact. So your team will always be loyal so long as they're convinced that you're worth following, that your heart is in the right place, that your ideas are sound, your values are great, your friendship is important, the environment is fun, you listen well, treat people generously and fairly with integrity and respect. And when they know there's no other job they would rather do or leader they would rather work for, you can change the world. My friends, if you can connect with all the passions that people have, understand where they're coming from, understand that they're whole people and they desire stimulation at work, yes, challenge and responsibility, but they really want to know how at the end of the day they make a difference, they understand they have families and relationships, then they will follow you to the ends of the earth. That's the NGO lesson. That's the reason you give time for nothing. That's the frustration, isn't it? Most of the people here are giving time for nothing. They're not even managed. They're not in a change management program. They're not even paid. They just do it. And what I'm talking about is capturing just 2% of that passion and bringing that into your situation, which in public services should be so easy compared to business. And when we can do that, then the lesson of history is that people will follow you to the ends of the world. And what is more, they may will be willing to work for you for next to nothing. Thank you very much. Now, I think we need to go straight on probably to the cards, is that right? Yes. I'm, I'm happy with that, yeah. unless there's anybody with a burning, burning question. I have one. Okay. Do you remember Yates, the best and the worst? The worst were full of passionate intensity. How do you distinguish wise passion from mere enthusiasm? Um, I wouldn't bother. I think, I think the English have got a real hang-up about it. I think the Welsh are better. Um, I, I think that uh, the English have always had this, you know, very restrained. And then we go berserk on the football pitch because it has to come out somewhere. I think as Welsh, the Welsh culture has always been much more holistic, I think, in understanding this business of passion purpose, and it's totally compatible with intellectual, uh, rational logic, and all the rest of it. So for me, um, I mean, uh, you know, people say, yes, how do you, uh, you know, I don't like people who rant, or I, I, I get very upset by people who are too enthusiastic and too much passion puts me off. I say, well, go and get a life. Go and work for someone else. Because, <laughs> listen, my friends, you know, listen, don't ever give a speech or give a talk unless you feel passionate about it. Life's too short, isn't it? 
If you don't feel passionate about it, it's not important. If it's not important to you, why the hell should it matter to anybody else? And it's the same with jobs. If you don't feel passionate about what you do, go and leave. Do everyone a favor. Go and find something else to do. Where you are passionate, where you get out of bed in the morning and say, I know why I'm alive. I know what I do. Uh, this is a very important issue. This team has to change. Or the impact of getting this right will save a lot of lives or will change people's environment. Um, that, so that's my answer. I'd say, don't be afraid of passion. We've locked away passion for too long. Um, and, uh, and, and, and look where we've got to. You get low morale. Morale is lack of passion. Low morale everywhere you look is lack of passion. Um, but where you have passion, then things happen. And it's impossible to make things happen without passion. Thank you, Patrick. Okay, let's do the cards. Okay, right, now, <laughs> this is something I'm passionate about. <laughs> By the way, okay, uh, some of you may say, well, I, I still don't like it. Patrick was much too passionate for me. I understand a little bit of passion, but just too much. <laughs> That's fine. Perhaps I'm reacting against this sort of acute allergic reaction to any kind of passion at work. Um, you know, management by objectives. May good Lord deliver us. Objectives can't create passion unless the objectives mean something in terms of purpose. But when they do, you don't need management by objectives. You're, well, you need them to check that it's actually happening, but it should be happening anyway. You'll find people will exceed their targets every single time, and the metrics will show it. You must have the metrics just to check. But there we are. Now, here's a metric. Here's a card. You've got one on your table. What we'd like you to do is to make some promises to you about the week, things you're thinking about, and maybe things that have been provoked as I've tried to gather together some of the thoughts of the week. So what we want you to write down is your name and address. That's the first thing. And the postage is free. And what we're going to do is we're going to mail these back to you in about 8 to 12 weeks' time to see how you're getting on. <laughs> so the idea is you're going to write down, I want you to write down five things that you have decided you're going to do in the next four to eight weeks when you go back. And I don't mind, it could be something in your very personal life. It could be something in your family. It might be something in your career path. It might be something you're going to say to a member of your team. It might be a group that you're going to gather together. It might be a different way in which you're going to lead. It might be a different activity that you're going to create. Um, it might be a new target that you're going to set. Uh, it might be um, an experience from this conference that you're determined to share, or an insight which you're going to put into practice through some training. Um, whatever it is, we want you to write it down. And actually, the more you put down, the better it will be. Because it's amazing how time flies. And my friends, you know, life's too short to attend conferences if nothing happens. Isn't it? I mean, what's the point? So I'd say that this week was a complete and utter waste of time. Unless, in eight weeks, 12 weeks, 14 weeks' time, you can point to things which have changed as a direct result. Don't you agree? Hello? I mean, otherwise, what was it we were just farting about? And actually, you know what? It disimproved your quality of life because you went back to a whole pile of extra work on Monday morning as a result. So let's really make it count. And let's focus on what it is that we can really change and uh, decisions that we can make to make a difference, make things happen, and connect with passion.